no idea. Why did Jesus die? Je did Jesus, I should really know this. Big question for early in the morning, isn't it? Jesus died for people, other people. He's saving us. Was it Pontius Pilate probably got a bit jealous of Jesus getting all the birds, so... We all die. People die for different reasons. Uh, to, well, it, it, I think it was supposed to be like for our sins, wasn't it? Jesus died because people didn't agree with him. Well, probably fear is why he died more than anything else. Didn't he like sacrifice himself on the cross? So, it's his choice. Jesus died because of people's beliefs. That's up for discussion. <laughs> Everybody dies. No one lives forever. The cross is the symbol of the Christian faith. It's kind of like the logo of Christianity. About a third of the Gospels are about the death of Jesus, and much of the rest of the New Testament is spent explaining why he died. I found that when I understood why Jesus had died, when I experienced what his death had achieved for me, it changed everything. Why did Jesus die? Well, the answer is because he loves you. There's a verse in the New Testament where Paul says, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. You are loved. That's the message at the heart of the New Testament. And it's the message at the heart of this universe. If you had been the only person in the world, Jesus would have died for you. It's as personal as that. He loves you that much. His love for you is unconditional, it's wholehearted, it's continual. It's the greatest love you could ever imagine. And that's the reason for the cross. It's God's amazing love for you. And that understanding completely changed my life. But why was it necessary? What's the problem? You're created in the image of God. God loves you, he created you. That means you're God's masterpiece. There's something amazing about every human being, something noble, something magnificent. Human beings are capable of such extraordinary creativity, music, art, literature. God's made you creative because you're created in his image. Human beings are capable of great self-sacrifice, devotion, kindness. But certainly in my case, there's another side to the coin. We're also capable of bad stuff. You only need to open the newspapers to see that terrible evil going on in this world. But the world is more complex than just saying, well, there are these evil people and they're good people, because it's more mixed than that. People who are capable of great love and devotion and kindness can also do some bad stuff. I've done some bad stuff in my life that I deeply regret. I've, I've hurt people, people that I love. The way the New Testament puts it is like this. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word sin can sometimes make me think of religious guilt or things like luxury chocolates and ice cream. The phrase, this is sinful, has become synonymous with something enjoyable. I saw an advert for ice cream that said, it's so good, it's sinful. But sin in the Bible is much more profound and relevant to you and me today than we sometimes realize. We're not talking about accidental mistakes or eating too much chocolate, but our seemingly natural inclination to mess things up to break stuff like promises and relationships that we care about and even our own well-being. And often we look around at others and think, okay, I get stuff wrong, sure, but comparatively, I'm not that bad, right? There are people doing far worse things than me. And if we're honest, we've all done stuff wrong. You know, Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the glory of God was revealed in Jesus. And compared to him, we all fall a long way short. So you might say, well, in that case, we're all in the same boat. Why does it matter? But there are consequences to the things that we do wrong. And the New Testament describes the impact of sin in a few different ways. Just as the pollution of our environment is a major problem, Jesus said it's also possible to pollute your life, your heart, 
And this is the pollution of sin. The things we do wrong can spoil our lives. Sin poisons our relationships with one another, and it also spoils our relationship with God. The bad stuff in our lives is also addictive. Sin is powerful. Yeah, I resonate with what St Paul said. What I want to do, I do not do. What I hate, I do. Jesus said, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. So for example, if you take heroin for a sustained period, you'll become addicted. But it's not just hard drugs. It's also possible to be addicted to things like a bad temper, envy, arrogance, pride, selfishness, slander, sexual immorality. This is the slavery that Jesus spoke about that has this destructive power over our lives. There is something in human nature that cries out for justice. Love and justice are not opposed. When we hear about a child being molested or about an elderly person being brutally attacked in their homes, we long for the people who do these things to be caught and punished because we believe there should be a penalty for sin. But it's not just other people's sins that deserve to be punished, it's ours as well. But it's easier to think about other people's and less so about ourselves. St Paul said, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you're condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. The things that we do wrong create a barrier. It's a bit like when you fall out with someone you love, like a family member or a close friend, and you can't look them in the eye. It's like there's something that's come between you. And the things that we do wrong, our sin, creates a partition, a barrier between us and God. And it's like the breakdown of a relationship, not just with God, but also all our relationships. That's the problem. That's the bad news. So what's the solution? Well, the good news is that God loves you. And he came to the earth in the person of his son to do something about it, to die for you and to die for me. The apostle Peter puts it like this. He himself, that is Jesus, bore our sins in his body. By his wounds, you have been healed. It's been described as the self-substitution of God. What does that mean? On the 31st of July, 1941, sirens rang out from cell block 14 in Auschwitz concentration camp. A prisoner had escaped. And as a re reprisal, the Gestapo selected 10 men, arbitrarily, to die in a starvation bunker. The ninth man selected was a man called Francis Gajewniczek. And when he was selected, Francis Gajewniczek cried out. He said, oh, he said, my poor wife and my children, they will never see me again. At that moment, a, a small man with wireframe glasses took off his cap and he walked forward and he said, I'm a Catholic priest. He said, I don't have a, a wife and children. I want to die instead of that man. And to everyone's amazement, his offer was accepted. The name of that man was Maximilian Kolbe, 47 years old. And he was taken with the other nine to the starvation bunker. Amazing guy. He, he got them praying, singing hymns. Apparently the atmosphere in there was, felt like a church in there. Eventually they needed the starvation bunker for other people. And so on the 14th of August, 1941, he was given a lethal injection of carbolic acid. 41 years later, on the 10th of October, 1982, the death of Maximilian Kolbe was put in its proper perspective there in St. Peter's Square, Rome, in a crowd of 150,000 people with 26 cardinals, 300 bishops and archbishops, was Francis Gajewniczek. And the Pope described the death of Maximilian Kolbe on that occasion in these terms. He said it was a victory like that won by our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Maximilian Kolbe had died for someone else, instead of someone else. That someone else was Francis Gajewniczek.
I happened to see his obituary in the independent newspaper. He died at the age of 93. And he had spent the rest of his life going around the world telling people what Maximilian Kolbe had done for him because he had died in his place. And in an even more remarkable way, Jesus died instead of you and instead of me. Crucifixion was the height of pain and depth of shame. Yet interestingly, the New Testament doesn't dwell on the physical suffering, the torture, the crucifixion, because actually other people in history have died perhaps even more horrible deaths physically. Indeed, even now around the world, people are being crucified. But the suffering of Jesus was unique because not only was he suffering physically and emotionally, but he was suffering spiritually because he was bearing on himself your guilt and my guilt. The cross and the resurrection are like one event and the results of the cross is like the different facets of a beautiful diamond. One facet is it shows us just how much God loves you. Guilt is feeling bad about the stuff that we've done. Shame is feeling bad about who we are. And on the cross, Jesus took your guilt, your shame, my guilt, my shame. And therefore, there's no need for guilt or shame because you are loved. Your worth is what you're worth to God. And you are of infinite value to God because Jesus died for you. That's how much he loves you. Another facet is it shows the true nature of love. Love is not just a feeling. Love is more than words. It involves actions. Jesus demonstrated that. He showed his love by laying down his life for us. He sacrificed himself for us. My dad died a couple of years ago after about eight years of suffering from dementia. And it was by far the hardest thing that we as a family have had to deal with. Uh, seeing him go from the sort of loving father and dad and brilliant physicist that he was, um, sort of descending into this fog of memory loss and confusion and anger and fear. Uh, it was horrible to watch. And in those times, I remember asking seriously questions like, why? Why him? Why us? Why now? What possible purpose could that have? How could God allow that to happen to him? How can God allow that to happen to anyone? How can suffering happen when God loves us? And those are questions that crop up a lot in the Bible. You read in the Psalms questions about why is God so far away? And that's how it felt, was God was far away. And, and yet it's important to ask those questions. Being a Christian, believing in God doesn't mean you can't have doubts and ask questions the whole time. You know, Jesus himself cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But actually it was on the cross, it's the death, the suffering of Jesus and his death on the cross, which I found gave me not a complete answer, but some help as I was going through that because it helped me understand that God's not aloof, far away, sitting on some cloud, but actually he came in Jesus and suffered himself. He knows what it's like to suffer and he died. And therefore he understands what we're going through. If we're suffering, he's with us in that suffering. And eventually my dad uh, died, and actually, sounds strange to say it, but it was a bit of a relief. And uh, I had this strange sense of peace all the way through. And a lot of that was to do with reading about Jesus' resurrection. 
the resurrection of Jesus shows us that death's not the end. That ultimately, Jesus has defeated death. And that even though we might suffer now, one day, there'll be no more suffering and there'll be no more pain. The resurrection was not the reversal of a defeat that had taken place on the cross. It was the manifestation of a victory. And what it tells us is that the bad stuff is not going to have the last word. You may be in difficult times. You may be really struggling with stuff. But evil will not have the last word because evil has been defeated on the cross. The story ends well. And then we see that the, the cross dealt with all these problems that we've seen about sin. Through the cross, the partition between us and God has been removed. You can come home to God. St. Paul puts it like this. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ. It's not that on the cross God punished some innocent third party, Jesus. That would be barbaric. No. God himself came to this earth in the person of his son. God was in Christ reconciling you and me to God. It's like the prodigal son, the story which Jesus told of a son who'd, who'd gone away from home, who'd left his father, who'd wandered away, and then he comes back home. I love Charlie Mackesy's sculpture to illustrate the prodigal son. This picture of the father, the loving father that Jesus described, who when the son comes home, when you and I come home, he embraces us, he hugs us, he kisses us, he loves us, he holds us. We're reconciled to him. We can have this close, intimate relationship with the Father. And when we're reconciled to God, what I've found is that helps to bring reconciliation to all our other relationships. Jesus has paid the price. All you have to do is accept the free gift. It's not like buy one, get one free. It's more like buy none, get everything free, which sounds too good to be true. But we can't just go around and do what we like because we know we'll be forgiven every time. In fact, it's the opposite to that. Rather than being the reason to sin, it's an incentive not to sin. So I'm often asked, why did you get involved with crime? I say it wasn't a conscious decision. I didn't see the careers lady at school and say, of course, you can do an armed robbery. It was just there. It was all around us. And it all started with weed and drinking, cannabis, the usual stuff. Um, we used to steal badges off expensive cars and swap them up like trading cards. And it just progressed to the entire car. And I got involved with the people who were really pulling all the strings. So we went up to this guy's house who owed them a few hundred pounds. It was, it was nothing to them. But the problem was he'd been going around telling everybody that he wasn't going to pay it. So they had to set an example. So they got this guy, he was in his garden, his little lad was there. So he got out of the car, grabbed this bloke, put him in the car, sat between us, and he drove up to uh, what's called Niner's Quarry and uh, pulled a petrol strimmer out of the boot of the car, gave it to me and said, do his feet. So strimmed his feet, just lacerated his feet and this was my initiation so that just moved on and on and on cut a long story short Leeds Crown Court courtroom number three he handed me down seven and a half years and I just thought to myself that's it gloves are off if I'm gonna be bad I'm gonna be the best kind of bad I can possibly be because I got moved from prison to prison to prison and put on category A maximum security because of my behavior and there's this lad coming round another inmate he comes up to me and he says uh, do you want to go on an alpha course no idea what he was talking about. I said, look, get out my face, sunshine, before I slap you. I thought no more of it. And next day, and then this kid's coming around with his clipboard again. So I'm just waiting for this kid to get within slapping range. And he must have sensed something wasn't right because he blurted something out really quickly. He went, you get Wednesday afternoon at a bang up and you get free coffee and you get free biscuits. <gasps> All right, I'll see you on Wednesday. And we just 
started giving her a hard time, a really hard time. The thing that stopped me, it wasn't what they said because I wasn't really listening, but it was how they did it. They came back at me with love and compassion every single time. So I sat there on my bunk and I said the first real prayer I'd ever said in my life. I didn't know if I was doing it right or not. But the gist of it was, God, I need you to take away the anger, the violence, the hate. I need you to take away the addictions, which I've tried to fight and I just lose every time. And if you do that for me, I will live the rest of my life for you. But the next morning, I woke up as I always had done. Rolled over to grab the smoke as I always had done, but I couldn't touch it. Everything about it, the look, the thought, the smell, everything made me want to be sick. And I knew what I had to do, so I went and got my little stash and I put it straight out of the cell window. And as soon as they'd gone, I started to feel a bit better. I started to calm down a little bit, but I was still freaking out. So I just said to myself, Daryl, calm down, go get a wash, go get a shave. And as I started to get a wash, I looked in the mirror and just stopped dead. Because I didn't recognise my own reflection. I was like, that guy's smiling. Not just smiling, that guy's beaming. And I noticed I didn't just look different, I felt different. Everything had gone. It was as if someone had unscrewed the top of my head and just poured freezing cold water in and everything had been just washed out clean. So the chaplain comes onto the wing and I just told him absolutely everything. And he said, the man that went to bed last night is not the same man that's standing here this morning. You're a new creation. And that was it. I said, no more. No more fighting, no more drugs, no more nothing. If you owe me anything, forget it. If you're holding anything of mine, keep it. I don't want it, I'm done, I'm finished. Jesus has saved me. And then when it came time for my release, I knew I was gonna go into full-time ministry. Reverend Mark Finch, JP, a magistrate, and he said, would you consider coming to Runcorn near Liverpool? We've got a new church plant, we're just getting going. There's a big problem with young people and gangs and drugs, would you come? I knew it was the right place to go. So he picked me up from the gates on the morning of my release. He took me to his house, not her house, his home. And his eldest is his daughter, Rebecca, who is now my wife and the mother to my two amazing children, Benjamin and Lydia Grace. My life just couldn't look more different than what it is now. Power of sin was broken through the cross. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Our addictions are broken. Before I was a Christian, I had a terrible temple. My father had a terrible temple, and I had inherited it, and I thought, that's it, I'm going to have a terrible temper for life. But what I found was that Jesus set me free. Other areas of my life, it's been a much longer process, and there's still things that I, I struggle with. To use two, two theological terms, justification happens instantly. You are put right with God instantly through the cross. But sanctification, that's the process of becoming like Jesus. It's a much longer process. St. John writes, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We receive continual forgiveness. So we need to be continually forgiving. For me, experiencing God's forgiveness made all the difference. Before I was a Christian, if someone had offended me, I'd hold a grudge against that person. But holding a grudge is like allowing the person to live rent-free in your head. I used to hold on to unforgiveness, thinking that I was doing the other person harm. But now I can see that unforgiveness did far more harm to me than it did to the other person. As someone said, not forgiving someone is like drinking poison and hoping the other person's going to die. Once you've experienced God's forgiveness, since God forgives you, you have to forgive yourself. And that's what I find the hardest. But we have to forgive because as C.S. Lewis points out, not forgiving ourselves is like setting ourselves up as a higher tribunal than God. If God forgives, you must forgive yourself. And we forgive others because we've been forgiven so much. Forgiveness is a choice, but it's not an option. And it's not easy. C.S. Lewis said, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. And then it's really hard. But it really is true that 
The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. One of my great heroes is Corrie ten Boom. She's a Dutch Christian who hid Jews during the war. She was caught and Corrie and her sister and her father went to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Her father and her sister Betsy died there. She's an amazing woman and after the war she went and spoke to others about forgiveness. She was speaking in a church in Germany one time and at the end of her talk she recognised the man coming up to her and she could see it was one of the most cruel guards from Ravensbrück. She pictured him as he was then. And as he came up to her, he said, I was a guard at Ravensbrück. He didn't recognize her, but she knew, she recognized him. She could see him, and she remembered walking naked past him. She said she felt so cold and so angry. He said, I've become a Christian now. I know I did some very cruel things, but I've received God's forgiveness for the cruelties I've done. And I ask God's grace for an opportunity to ask one of my very victims for forgiveness. Fräulein Ten Boom, once you were forgiven, forgiven, will you forgive me? And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who has given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. This total unlimited forgiveness. I can honestly say it transforms marriage, family life, all our relationships, all our friendships. God loves you. You are loved. The Son of God, Jesus, gave himself for you. When I understood that, it totally changed my life. And it can change everything for you too.